habits. You know? So, I have, so all of you will have references, right? All right. So, fortunately, all your composition, if you look at it carefully, it's been kind of figured out for you. But they're all they're all kind of rectangular. And we were talking about this one over here. You can see what I was talking about: how it carries you across, and then you're back down again. Then it carries you across. And then if you decide not to take this line, and you take the, the round part here, well, this is carrying you here. This is pointing on the inside. And then this iris carries you all the way back down here again. Right? And then in terms of colors, you've got a pink, a pinkish tone, pinkish tone, and then you go to the red, and then the red. So you can't help but put this all together. And then you have the yellow and the yellow, which is over here. These are kind of like supporting these guys over here, um, and the yellow with the blue blends itself as a nice contrast and complementary color. So the composition is solid, even this leaf coming up here, you see, and then this will jump to here, you see that, you see this diagonal, and then it drops down <coughs> here, and then it goes around, and then this diagonal, so it's bringing you into the picture point. Okay. So this is all by design. You're just looking at it, you're like, oh, nice picture. But yeah, but take a good look at it. Mm -hmm. I'd look closer now, you know. You'll see that we're going to be able to determine everything that we, we spoke about this morning that was told to you. Yeah? I have a question. This mm -hmm. isn't quite design, but ties into it. So when you're working with multiple references, how do you, um, you know, keep the light, the mm -hmm. uh, continuity going? You mean like the source, the source of light is coming from here to here? Yeah, lighting. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I just don't. I, uh, so just don't worry about that guideline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that applies in portraiture. You need that, you know, because mm -hmm. if you have a light from here and a light from here, it gives the face a certain figurative work right. also. And floral is not as much. I mean, if you really take a look at this, what, what I'm more concerned about is not so much the light. But what's pushed back and what's what's in the foreground, yeah. all right? What's okay. all right? So, but there is there is some kind of like modulation that happens with the volume, right? That we can talk about that after. And I think on the third day, I'll introduce you to glazing. That's a glazing technique because you're familiar with glazing in oils. Mm -hmm. I'll show you how to glaze in acrylic. And rather than wait six months for your glazing, you wait three minutes. So I have I have a series of references here that I really like and. Whatever jumps at me, I'm going to start looking at these and I'm going to say, okay, yay to this, nay to that. And I'm just going to start placing down something as far as the composition is something I would like to see. There's these elements which I like. Uh, so probably that will be introduced here because it's a nice introductory. Then it drops here and then I'll probably go get a flower from somewhere here. Remember, because you read it this way, it doesn't mean you can't turn it this way, all right? Whatever works. And then I'm like, oh, okay, that's going to work. I'm going to bring that back here. Drop type here. Okay? So it's going to be um, um, a composite of everything that we have going on. Okay? Basically blocking in. I 
I always check in to check out the structure of my flower. One of the things I like about flowers, and keep this in mind when you're painting them, would you go and buy at the flower market a flower that looks like it's been there for like two weeks and is falling apart, right? No, you want some of the freshest flowers, the most the freshest looking flowers. You want to buy something that is appealing to you, right? That's going to be beautiful in your home. So it's sort of the same idea when you start to paint. How my arm moves, right? It's like I determined the line this way. I kind of like what's going on over here. And then there's another one, possibly, maybe, maybe that might work. And I'm just giving you what's what's going on in my mind as I speak out loud. Put some contrast here to make these guys stand out. And then we to drop this thing. This is coming off, let me bring in something over here. And I don't know what's going on, I just know that I'm looking at the composition. I carry this further out over here. So I'm really coming in from this side. Okay, I want, I want this to come in this way. Coming over here, dropping over here. All right, so now I need something else for over here. I'll go up. It's a little bit of stuff. I do like this line that kind of drops, goes this way. And then there's a double line that goes this way. I have a flower here. Shapes, right? You see that? Turn my page upside down, move it this far. So I put a leaf, I put the flower, the flower is more important than the leaf. However, I do remember that it's here and I'm going to come back to it later on. So I'm not sacrificing the composite, the, uh, the composition for the sake of the flower. Like I absolutely want a flower that no, I absolutely want the composition to work. And then I'll decide and determine exactly the size of the flowers, the color. Right? But right now, this is what's more important to me. Okay. And then as I'm doing that, just more coming here. Here, and here. <coughs> this is the tricky part. I'm going to let the eye come off for a little bit here. This morning, just figure it out. So there, there's no color. The color is not my concern right now. That's really is sort of like an idea in my mind of like I'm bringing you in this way. And there's one flower, two flowers. Foliage is the introduction. Now there may be something on top of it, which there will be, but you can't do it now. You have to you have to be really patient with yourself. This is step number one. 
and then you come in this way. Oh, there's some foliage over here, but I dropped this leaf so that it meets whatever's here. This is bringing me into another flower. Now, in the room, in the conversation of the room, these two came in together as a couple, and then suddenly we're being directed to this person that's speaking to the rest of the room here. From here, there's this big branch that carries me into this flower that's facing this way. I know that that could be a potential problem. The flower is facing this way, and it's going to be red. So chances are it's going to come right off the cage. So I'm going to bring in something else, bring it right back again. But what I do have over here, okay, for right now is this. But I have these two that are shooting up, and back down and go again. Okay. So I'm not caught in perpetual movement. There's these things that I told you earlier, where you can bring in certain areas that will block you, and you use the leaves as part of the arrows that are pointing you in the direction where you, you need to go. If, if you were doing this with a vase, as in some of the uh, illustrations this morning, would you put the uh, table or whatever it is that the vase rests on, would you put that in first and let it dry and then go over this with this sort of thing? No, I would still use the same thing, except the, the table would be a straight line right across. Like I would know that that's a table, and then the balls would just be a line. Everything is kind of like in linear form. I haven't filled anything in, in yet. Okay, so it doesn't matter that you don't start back and come forward. No, no, which is an oil technique, right? When you start from the background and work foreground, no. I'm telling you this is how you're doing this. Yeah. 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 Did you think about one third, two thirds? Yep. Or, mm -hmm. okay, it's all there. It's all there if you take a look at it. I was thinking I, this way, right? Yeah, well, right now what I have the the pending danger that I have is that this is yeah. split half, right? Yeah. But I do have this, which is in the one third over here. Okay. I've got this, which is in the one third, two thirds, or this one third, two thirds. So what's starting to happen is there's a tri triangulation that's starting to happen, which is okay, all right? Because the triangulation is also another compositional element that really solidifies the composition. Remember that the triangle is the strongest structure that we have in geometry, right? So if that's in there, your eye is already starting to do this, so it's not going anywhere. Okay. Any questions? So, so it's almost better to work with a square canvas? I like square because it's just a little more contemporary, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with a uh, rectangle like that. I can repeat the same problem, you know, with the composition in a rectangle. I, I'll, I'll find a solution, as long as you know that you just got to bring your eye back down. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm saying, why like the composition becomes like vital? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's the one part, and I don't know how you're going to do with it when you do the human figure, but there is, there are going to be elements that you're just going to see the figure and then there's just a background, but how are you going to manipulate that to make sure that the eye comes back into your image? Yeah. Okay? And you know, I've seen a lot of that. Like I've seen like even just a stance that I'm holding like this, and I'm kind of looking this way. <coughs> My, my arms are in tri triangle right now. So if you look at the top of my head, to the base of my arms, and I'm looking this way, all right, you see it. You're locked in. You're locked in. If I put my hand like this, as opposed to if I put my hand like this, you're off the page. As soon as I do this, you're back in. See? Like that. I go like this, not as much. Stronger, or, yeah, that's, that's what you start to look for. So when you pose your model, you look at that, you look at your page, and you start to see it. Oh, there, there it is. Okay. So uh, the large part of that was done with this brush. And uh, the approach 65, the other thing that it does is it allows you, you can just leave your paint out for a little while, which is, which is good. You won't, it won't dry up on you. Does somebody have, do you have any magenta in your home, if you don't mind? Uh, do you kind of have a ratio of the 65 that you use with your paint? Yeah, usually I don't put as much as I did there. Um, it's probably like three, three parts paint, one part to throw. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I agree. Like you almost put half in half. Yeah. yeah, no, that's too much. Like some of it stayed on the side. Mm -hmm. I'll use it though. It's not going to go to waste. Um, and so then, here you go. Just a little bit of this, right? And then you use the approach. Five, which you can fill a bit more. Three parts paint, one part of the clip is the
But it varies, you see, because what I'm looking for right now. Let's see. Okay. So we are looking at this beautiful reference right there. Saying it's like it's you're not so gentle at this stage. Like, force your way through the painting, take command, take control of it. Like you need to be in control of this thing. same time what I'm doing is I'm creating the pedal. This is why it's important to have larger brushes because it also allows you to go small if you need to. And I can kind of twirl. But you see that's all this is also a bit more the, the finessing. Okay so are you at the finessing completely at this stage? No. It's a little too early but I'll show you for the So it's it's not all polished. There's there's areas where it gets a little rough. I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna use it. Okay. And then then I look at that and I'm like, eh, this is a nice little finesse in there. I'm putting a little finesse for this. Take a look like a ready to two um, two two runs, right? Because the first run, the first run's already dry. I could look with oil. You do it for three months. No, I don't think you use it. Right? Air dryer, air dryer, whatever. I mean, it oxidizes, so you can't you can't dry, but you get the feel of it. It's like just a few strokes, and it feels like a big blooming flower. Okay, and yeah. so. The whole point of why I paint in acrylic is because I want to remove the weight 
of the academic way of painting. My whole purpose is that. My whole purpose is to just to flash wood and paint from the heart and just bring out whatever's there. Right? Now, I like what's going on over here. I like what's going on over here. I'm going to mix, because um, um, it's a peony, so I so I want to keep some of that magenta in there. Maybe introduce salt. So, this a lizard and crimson. But you see where my head is? It's not even like, oh, I need to put this color with that color because the theory tells me. I'm like, ah, nah, this looks good. Let's go. Uh, and so then I mix that. As you put in the background, these details are just going to pop in by themselves. <laughs> so I do take into account that in the sense that, as you can see it over here, the light is hidden here. But you're well versed in that. You, you do portraits, so you have to know more about it and follow it. But you'll notice that my volume is more what I'm concerned with. The light hits here and I'll darken this part over here. This flower is behind here, so I'll kind of give it a shadow. Right? And then it'll Remember, I'm not so much working this way, but I'm more working this way. Okay. So that is sort of a sort of second nature. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's also elements, because then elements of design come into play that you might want to keep in as part of the language of what you're trying to say. Now notice like I'm not just painting it this way. Like, I just went in like this, I dragged up and went down, went like this, like this. Now in painting pieces, you understand the structure, like when you do a nose, it has a certain structure, you kind of have to hug that structure and make it work for you. Any other part? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no? Mm -hmm. Get it? Yes. painting in the demo, but we put it gone, it won't be around. So what makes it, what constitutes a nice green? Well, we have a sap green here, which is really nice. Well, 
<coughs> it's a great color for green. Um, we can put in maybe a little cobalt teal in there, which would be nice, or cerulean blue. And I have enough acrylic 65 in there that I'm still using it. Mm -hmm. And I will just kind of grab that, grab a bit of this, a bit of this. That's a very interesting element. That's another part of the design elements that you can put within your painting. That, that makes a lot of push and pull. Okay, that's, that's interesting. You look at that, you like, because what it does is it layers. It starts to layer your painting this way. So now you're creating depth, okay? And so, um, you can be very loose brush. Um, with assertion and invention in your brush, you paint with that in your mind. Basically, somebody took it from Pinterest, and I'm just using it for the sake of a demonstration. Sometimes I use flowers, sometimes I use real flowers. Mm -hmm. I use fake flowers also. I have those set up in my studio too. So become friends with floral designers on Instagram. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to do it, actually. I'm, I'm just, I'll give you credit. 
There's so much information you can use up there. And the important thing is that you use it as a raw, raw source file. You're not, you're not yeah. copying your work. To the right. so, and there's copyright infringement. <laughs> Always, yeah. Especially when the canvases get really abstract, then the keep rotating to see if the uh, if the, um, the composition is solid on all, all angles. But that's mostly when they go really full abstract, and that's something that I learned by observing Kuning's uh, work. We started to bring that into the forehead. So is that white pink you're using right out of the tree right now? No, this is a mixture of titanium white with uh, some okay. of that. Right. Okay, so now I'm looking in. Now, if whatever was going on here, it's being caught by this, it's being pointed in by this leaf. You see that leaf there? I'm forcing you in here, and if I still miss you, well, uh, this is bringing you in, and then there's this line that's carrying you here. But I am giving it some space to breathe. Like I haven't taken everything to be to the, to the outside part of the periphery of campus. Doing the sketch, you're already diluting the impetus of having to do it at the first run. Yeah. Because there's a spontaneity to that that, that gets translated. You can see it here. You see the spontaneity. There's, right. there's a lot of little elements that are really nice. That then would probably what you need to figure out afterwards. Like, do I keep them? You know, is it, is it risky for me to keep them, or do I take a chance and learn and go and go into a new area? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you for allowing me to use your your things. <laughs> It's almost, it's impossible to remove off the canvas. 
because it, it, it actually it becomes plastic. Now's a good time for me to start putting a bit of color in here to where I want this to go. <clears throat> happy, right? Yeah. I'm gonna keep it happy. stressing don't look so much at the flower look at the shape of the flower like I put the paintings there because I knew that it would carry your eye around mm -hmm. sometimes those little viney things it's just a shape uh, it's just their elements to direct your eye I think snakes and ladders remember that game mm -hmm. like something goes up something goes up and something goes up and then back down again That's sort of what you're doing here going for three hours, I'm like, all right, that's pretty good. So some of these smaller brushes will come in handy now, uh, but for the sake of demo, I'll just, I'll use a bigger one. And, um, Probably going to have 
have something going on over here. So I'm going to start darkening a bit of this. Put a bit of a shadow here. Start offering a couple of things. See how I just drew over that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, composition, more important than the actual flower. I have to overlap it for the sake of the composition so that it works. That's what I need. Basically, all you're doing is you're problem solving. You're, every day we wake up and we solve a problem. Same thing here. It doesn't change, right? So the, what, what happens now is you look at that, and then we're to say, OK, that's, that's solid. That's good. That flower looks like it needs some love. It looks like it got squashed between two, two things. You see how it's like? It's because I kind of been working sideways. But I can, I can use a little more roundness. I can make it a little more sexy. This is looking really tight. And like, Washed. Let me round this out a little more. So that becomes also part of the dialogue of like the appeal of the painting. You want to make sure that if you go to the market and you buy the flowers, you're not going to buy the ones that are wilted and the ones that look like they're been there for three weeks. You're going to buy the freshest ones. So your attitude should be the same thing with this. I want the freshest flowers, the best looking flowers on my painting. It makes sense, it makes sense no? So I'm correcting the uh Always bring back the drawing. 
Because as soon as you put the paint on top, you're going to lose a bit of that drawing. You want to keep bringing it back. You want to keep bringing it back. And some of it for me is this is the analysis of what I want this to be good, I want it to be beautiful. So shape, I want the shape is important to me. Um, I want to present to you something that you know, looks accurate. And then you know, kind of start to get into some details just a little bit. Like really not a lot, because it's not a lot going on here. But I want to see, I kind of have to look at myself and I'm gonna go in that area, I'm gonna go in that area. I can see where the painting's starting to take shape. I'm gonna go there now. And the big question is, should it be red or should it be a white flower? Because that's gonna be a lot of red. So in order for me to do it red, I'm gonna have to counterbalance it with some different colors. What happens if it's blue? Well, what blue flower, that's the only part that I would say, yeah, what blue flower would there be? I drink there and iris. Would it fit within that composition? I can make it fit, which means I have to redraw the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So then, so you have to, like, you're this far in the stage of it. We'll go right. Let's try right. I was going to say, because I see hints of warm red in mm -hmm. that layer of magenta. Yeah. So you see where you're thinking, right? Yeah. Now this is the thinking part. This is the thinking part. This is where you are. Because you're back into composition. So you remember we were talking about how, how does the dialogue work? Well, then the dialogue starts to be like that. Well, I have an agenda. I'm going to put the red. And then suddenly you're going to have an impetus as you're sitting down and you that's it. And that's the part where you're not thinking. You get up and you do it. If you don't do that move, you're back into thinking and you're all, you know, paralysis analysis. Because it's a color paint, you can always paint over it. Yeah, but well, you, you won't. And if you painting something that is, you have to understand it's the first response at least you want to go with. So for me, the first response is red. I'm going to try it. Let's see what it is. balancing the red. Mm -hmm. That burnt umber, green, needs to get darker so the red pops out a little more. The center part needs to get darker and then I have a problem. To put the ash between here, I have to make the liz on here. I only really have a problem here. This this can be worked out. That's that's an easy one. But this is my problem. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. And in the 
dialogue in your head would be like, oh, this isn't working, stop it, you messed that up. It's like, well, oh, how many paintings have you done? You know, how many paintings have you done? You've done a lot of paintings, so why would this one be any different? Why would you mess this one up? Your brain's going to want you to mess it up, yeah. Back to the stack green, and I'm just keeping consistency, right? For now. Um, I'm going to burn a little bit. And then I'll put just a little bit of a jump in. When you do portraits, do you do them in a cut? Yes. And they're usually very large, so it's four or five feet high. I have to take care of that. Right? 
So here we are now. So just as a reminder that I have a situation there that I need to resolve, I'll come in and I'll continue this mark. And I'll go here, behind the leaf, and right in front of the flower. And then behind the leaf, and right in front of the flower. And there's something placed there. The other thing I need to have is at some point, it's going to kick back up this way. So I'm back in there again. Okay. So again, I'm not concerned with the flower per se, concerned with the composition. And you see me making the adjustments. It's like, there's just some draw off the page. It doesn't matter. I just, I just stop. Kind of making a map. Always. Map. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, it's a world map. That's exactly it. Somebody else had described it as that once, and I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So, you know, moving forward, I'll just show you the value of something like this is that. back and say, oh, I need, I need to place something in there because it is in the program. I want. And as soon as you do that, a lot of the information that's here, I'm not finished with this flower, but a lot of the information that's here almost becomes not as important. You're, you're looking at it, you're like, I don't need to push the flower that much because it's the focus part, the focus is on me. But you can see where there's that gap between those two flowers. I, there's a problem there for me. That's, that's a problem. Um, so how am I going to fix it? I don't know right now. But chances are I'll probably come with some white hydrangeas to find that it's, it's red heavy. Find the worst of the complementary of the leaves. The leaves at the top, you see that big band that's coming in? It's, it's weighing down. So that will be a good part, a good place to start. I should open that up. And then it's opening up the space. Just drag this across. Oh, wow. We've introduced the one element to it. All right. And just continue it just a little bit. And again, mm -hmm. in the home area, right? Yeah. right. So it seems to be able to have the, uh, the strength, uh, the mental strength to be able to go in there. And sure, it was beautiful. Like, oh my God, it was just beautiful. We'll touch it. And then you do this, and you're like, oh wow, it's even better. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's not soft if you had the idea. Like that, that was a spontaneous moment. I was like, oh, boom. There we go. Let that dry. I love this. I love that there's a transparency here. Let it dry. Focus on this and be fine. Let it sit. So again, you're layering. You added just another layer to the whole thing. And then once, once uh, the more layers you put, like that's the richness of the painting. You're not just working at one level. You're traveling to the to the painting. And then want to try the next step. <laughs> <laughs> So now I go back to my reference, and I'm like, hmm, all right, that works, that works, that works. This guy needs a bit of work, but before I move forward, I'd like to add another element one back here Listen to this. Hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a good time to work. Come out. Yeah. Come out. Mm. Could 
could this to you like be a finished painting or do you clearly see it needs more work? It needs more work. However, two more steps and I can make this into a finished okay. painting. Okay. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be super elaborate type of painting. I know what you mean. Yeah, uh, yeah it could definitely be a finished painting. Okay. And some people would stop here. Okay. But we won't. <laughs> Alright, so not, that's the other kind of thing. Is that with acrylic, you really have to be able to press and see. Like this area here, if I were to continue painting on top, I could do it two ways. And I'll show you how to do it. The first way, I would not do it. Because if you scramble and you disrupt what's underneath, you're going to remove the painting and you're going to create a hole. You're literally going to create a hole in the canvas. Like the acrylic is going to spread and you're going to be back onto the, to the canvas. However, if you have a nice light touch and a light hand, and you'll put something in there um, that will not leave a hole and still allow you to, um, to put a mark. Now, I do want to introduce some of that blue, which will be all right. If you've been on my Instagram, you've seen me do this quite often. And this is like really touching the top. Yeah. See how the brown has not moved at all. It's like frosting a cake. Yeah, that's exactly it. Or giving your husband a chip of rice around the face. Depends <laughs> <laughs> where you're at. <laughs> so here, I come in and I'll start layering some of this. And what happens is you, you really need a lot of paint. Yeah. All right? And then you, you lay it down. And it gives a really beautiful texture to the painting. Now you start to build some of that texture, textural quality. Again, thick, and you're laying it very gently on top. Yeah. Still directing your eye back in here. I'm going to pull this over here. sound of that note, well, you want to overuse it because then it's all going to sound the same. This is what's happening here. This is just by using the acrylic 65. So whenever I need to go thicker, so what that looks like is this. This is the surface of the canvas. You're literally just doing like this. 
you're not doing this, you see the difference in the brush? You're just gently going like this, right across. You let the paint scrape off by itself. So I have, I have no control over this, but I kind of know exactly what looks nice. So I like when I'm thinking about it. Is it going to stay like this? No. First draft, this is going to have to dry. This is still sticky from the glue in there. But there are areas that can work. It can probably still work here. I'm going there. Right? And that's part of the evaluation as I'm going back and forth. I lost a bit of my line over here. Is this dry? Not quite, not yet. This is coming out really nice. And, you know, touch your pants. Like, let it speak to you. Figure out where it's at. Um, so, this is coming right off. I'm going to bring it back up again. Possibly bring in something like this. At that point, I'll probably take one of these sleeves. This is probably going to be easier. Period decision is how I want. Um, sort of like what sort of textural quality I want to give to the to the painting. Like this this was the decision here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where does the acrylic medium uh, come into play? I, I really don't use it in acrylic medium. It's the acrylic sixty five that I use. Yeah. I mean that the medium is. You yeah, glazing? yeah, make a full body glaze. Yeah, you, you, can, you can kind of wait. I mean, try not to use it while you're painting because it's like that kind of glazing medium. It, um, it locks you in. It's, like, it, 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 it's really probably more for finishing at this stage of the game where everything's kind of drying at a different level. It's, it's really difficult to get in there with that. So you sort of want to hold off to the end. And maybe I'll use it for uh, mostly touch ups. But we're going to do something with varnish, which is going to be, you can appreciate the varnish all okay. Deepen that a little bit more and make that flower pop out. I can also work that flower a little bit more, which I will. I like the introduction of the green. And I'm like, where else can I put some of that green? Probably not right now. That red flower is a bit of a problem, it takes up a lot of space. And you know, I still have a bit of a gap between the two, which I want to take care of. Um, but I think initially I'm going to tackle that flower on the, on the right 
Is it's ready. Uh, the temperature is right. <laughs> this one here, I can't touch it probably until tomorrow. Or you see, I like I like these streaks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I like these streaks. So that's part of the vocabulary. And if you paint on top of it, you'll lose them. So you have to be patient. And you either work on another painting, or you leave the studio and just go to something else. Okay. But this to me is worth keeping. Now, go back tomorrow, those streaks are there, we'll do the painting again. Man, those streaks really suck, you know? So I'll make paint on top of it. how it goes. Today, that's how I feel. Tomorrow. So what brush do I use? I'm just going to go on with some finessing in there. With the white, and the titanium white. Beautiful color. Golden makes a beautiful titanium white picture. Also like that, some of the one like some of the unexpected mixed in with some of that yellow. I'm like, yeah, I didn't lose that there. I'll refine it afterwards, but looks good. I wasn't thinking. And this one I mean by mixing on a large part of it is mixed on the canvas. It's a whole part of it that I don't even think about. I just I just respond. Do you always use canvas or do you use boards, panels, something? Um, no, I always use canvas, but um, because at the end, what I like to do is I like to come in with um, some street acrylic markers. Uh, I have my canvases built in a certain way so it has resistance. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a board. Pasta? Uh, Molotov oh. and uh, crunk. And then I also mix my, my own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But along those lines, yes. See how the finessing. So we're getting closer and closer. We keep going and going. And we're going to stop here because uh, I would mind continuing it tomorrow. Um, you can you know, use this as a sample for today just so you understand, but try and at least bring yourself to the point where you're putting that mechanic in your composition. That's part of your structure. And when you're going to get to this point, if you do, you stop. Okay, don't, don't, don't overextend it. You're going, because otherwise, you see the vibrancy of all of this, you're going to keep pushing it to a level where it's going to become muddy. You don't want that. You want to keep the vibrancy going. Things are happening with this fiber and fiber. These colors are really nice. The piece is a happy piece. We moved away from the burnt umbers and sort of like that 
heavy, uh, you know, academic Picasso that we always took down as I was drawing his face. I don't do this here. You saw that whatever it is that I did, it's quickly um, replaced and it with some brighter colors. And even if this is this is here, it's already dry, you keep on top of it, it's gone. So really that this color, which was soft green, like some kind of green, some kind of red, to get your really deep but not black color, that's enough to put that in your line, your drawing. And as you paint, you lose your drawing, you go back on top of it again. You, you know, you keep painting, you saw that, and you restructure your drawing. I restructure, I restructure my drawing continuously, at least three, four times, and I keep doing that. I, I, don't, I don't stop with that. If you lose your drawing, your whole painting is going to go sideways. All right, so bring yourself back. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a weakness, it's a strength to be able to see that. It's not a weakness to be able to understand composition. That's your strength. Because then you can just slap paint anywhere. It doesn't matter. This is what I've been doing. I'm just making marks. But the foundation, the solid part of the, of the canvas is there. Any questions? Because I can show you the, I'll show it to you now. <laughs> We're not doing that, right? I'm just gonna show it to you. What's really cool about this? Just regular paint, put a little dab there, right? And especially if you're using like um, these guys over here that are fluid. Okay. Normally, this when you mix it in the cup, it looks even better. But for the sake of demo, you mix all of that together. That's the 65. So it actually extends your red. Right, so you've now, you now have a double quantity of red that was there before. Does it also kind of act as a, like a glazing medium? Not as much, no. no. It does act sort of like some more of a fluid. So about two or three drops of this, not too much. All right. Okay, so. That's called thickener number one. <laughs> so here it goes. Stay that way. As long as you don't touch them, you'll come back tomorrow. You'll see that's good. I didn't put any thickener in there. The 65 was enough for there. But if you put the thickener number one, this is this is not going to move. And I did this once as a demo for students, and I left a brush like this. And honestly, the entire workshop never moved. What's the drying time? Uh, this can take. I mean, it'll dry back tonight, you know. But when when you start working in this way, now you have to remember, you basically built like a valley, right? Microscopically, you're doing this. Mm -hmm. If you go to the opposite leg, okay, that's going to pick up that paint on the top. But once it's dry, you have to, this is a different approach. But I showed this to you because if you want to start applying it, day three, you can. Um, there's a lot to learn first, but you can eventually get it to this point like this. And it's a lot of fun. I mean, you can see just, like you said, it's like peanut butter and then, Right? But working um, thick on thick on thick on thick, this part, of, this part here, which is the ridge of the valley, if you're not putting paint in there, or if you are, it's going to create its own light source. And it could be very, it could be very perplexing when you look at the paint. I had a trouble on a face. Right. The light gets it right Right. Wrong place. Like, the light would hit right in the wrong place, especially with portraits. And I deal with portraits. Or if you look at it sideways too. Like right, that. right. But it does, it does work if you're doing uh, florals and landscapes. It does. I mean, I've used it quite often on that. And, uh, so and I just, I love building it up to this. But not, not, it doesn't have to be so thick, you know, just, just thick enough so you can lay it down. And, and a lot of the paintings that you see, when you see my paintings, when you see them with that sort of impasto, it's because I've used, uh, and, I, and again, 
don't use a small pressure. If I use, this is like a pallet that allows me to put it down. But if I need to pressure, I just twist it. Whereas with a pallet, you don't. Mm -hmm. Like you, you can get, you can twist it this way. You can't do that with a pallet. A pallet is like hitting the same note on the can over and over. Dun, 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 so what happens dun. when you glaze those ridges then? Because a lot of times I know for, oil it'll sit in the yeah. valley i mean this is microscopic too it yeah. makes a difference it'll sit in the valley yeah, yeah, same, thing. same thing it'll it sit does. in there which it's okay it works yeah mm -hmm. uh, i use a varnish like an acrylic varnish i don't use an oil varnish to, to varnish it and i buy it at home depot mm -hmm. you know, the min wax yeah, yeah. The min -wax. so normally like tomorrow uh, i would put a varnish on top of this and then i would paint on top of the varnish I'm no longer painting on top of the canvas. Okay, so why? Think about it. It looks rich. So what happens when you put a varnish in your painting? You're not going to lose anything underneath. Right, and you're actually putting a thin layer of glass. Mm -hmm. So there's not the light up. So the light gets hot and glass. And bounces all over the place. So in a few hours, this painting's going to be very fine once it's fully dry, because right now I can still move movement. In order to revive the painting again, that's just, this is a problem I had, and I decided to put some varnish on it. And I think it just went poof with the second layer. I said, oh, that's interesting. Let the second layer dry, put another layer of varnish, and I'm like, well, even brighter. And now I start to put the varnish in my paints, and I start to paint with them. That's so how you get it to look like oil. Right. right. So people are like, that's an oil painting. I don't know if that's an oil painting. But you can see already the start. So the oil painting in your first draft is going to be dark, right? Most of the time it's dark and it's, you know, it has yellow ochres and browns. And I get the process, I understand. You don't have to do that with a color. And I kind of start that way so you have a reference point. You don't freak out on me like, oh, we, we start with the browns. So I start with the brown. But you can see how easily, with just that I want to paint uh, and opacity, you can cover that brown very quickly. And how long did it take? Jeez, it took about two hours. Yeah. My, my whole purpose is to get in and get out. <laughs> I love what I do, I swear I do. But the fact that I can do it quickly, I love it even more. I have spent hours and hours on paintings. And um, it's not how I paint anymore. My body's not made for that. It's just, so I have to respect this. Like my mind and my body cannot sit down on a chair for hours and work that kind of thing anymore. It's, um, this is how I work, you know? So, and that's why I introduced spray paint also, because it's like, that now I work with stencils. Like, not just stencils that you buy, I make my own stencils. Like, mm -hmm. you know, these t-shirt t-shirt people, you know, where you make t-shirt, you know, I design all my stencils and I design these flowers, I do these ste sketches. I have them burn the screens. And then I take the screen, I put on my canvas, with my assistant, like Andy Warhol, you know, just, you just pull it. So, beautiful. Next, put another one. And put underneath, there's this. So at a certain point, I start introducing those guys in there. Mm -hmm. And I'll have like certain flowers that I've designed that I want specifically to look like. And it overrides everything. It gives me a clean, crisp line. Rather than going in there with the brush, which I also do by going with the brush. So I have all these levels, these layers in my painting. You see. It's just, just part of it. Yeah. So do you work on multiple different paintings? Mm -hmm. You know, when you have yeah. a good chunk of studio time, just mm -hmm. have several going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really like to work on small paintings that are I like to take like 24 by 30 or 16 by 20 and I have a stack of these. Mm -hmm. And um, um, you know the artist Hans Lohmann who has all the bunnies? Yeah. yeah, he's a good friend of mine. So every time we'd hang out in New York, I'd go to his studio and I would see how he would paint. I said, Hans, you're doing all these, these bunnies. It was, it's, it's, uh, it's my warm ups. They're my warm ups. I said, geez, you sell your warm ups at $8,000 a pop. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, because they're warm ups. I said, that makes absolute sense. So I started going into my studio and just started loosening up, and, and in there, you solve a lot of problems. It's problem solving. Because then once you get to here, you're so, you're so used to having this sort of like, uh, you know, this, this way of working that is rhythmic, and, and you understand, you have the history behind you, you've made all your mistakes. When you get onto the big canvas, you're like, oh, not a problem, I, I did this in a smaller version. 
Okay. So those those are valuable for you too to work that way. Yeah. yeah? Well, in because uh, I'm new to a coex and I was trying to familiarize myself with them. Ampersand makes something called clayboard. Have you mm -hmm. ever used that? Mm -hmm. What's it like? Uh, clayboard is good. You can use everything on that, from pastels to oils to acrylic. And it's it's a, it's a gritty texture, and basically they use a pumice in their gesso, and they just keep running it this way, running it that way. It's good. It's going to absorb the hell out of your, your acrylics, for example. Uh, and so it's almost like your first draft almost disappears right into the clay into the clayboard. Um, I found that um, I like working on surfaces that are very slick, all right? So sometimes prior to beginning my canvas, I will cut coat it with three layers of, of varnish. So it's like a skating rink. And my brush is so it loosens me up. I stay, I stay very loose with it. And then the second layer, whatever paint is there, whatever you run across, that paint is gonna stop the flow. Naturally, it will just naturally stop the flow. You already have something on the surface. You paint on top of that, and then I bring back that smoothness by putting two more layers of varnish on top, and then I just keep painting on that. So I, I'm always playing between like texture, opacity, and transparency. Those are the three things. And that's again the language that's part of your composition also. Okay? That's a little more advanced. I don't want, but I'm just saying it for the sake of saying it. If that happens in your painting, leave it. Don't remove it. But don't go looking for it. Don't go looking for it. Because if you go looking for it, I want my painting to have this, this, and that. Then you're in your in your mind. Just spontaneously respond to whatever the painting is telling you to do. Okay. I recently had that in one of my workshops, and they, they, my students, after seriously after like a while of working with them, I said, "Let the painting tell you what is next. Stop trying to control what's in front of you." And you saw me. I sat down. I looked at it, and it was telling me things. It's like. This is good, this sucks, you need to fix that, boom, boom, boom. You get up and you do it, okay? Simple, very simple, but not easy. <laughs> well, just because it takes, it takes practice. Like the only difference between you and I is that I've just done it more often than you have. And then the more often you do this, you know, some of you will be teaching this stuff, so selling your work and teaching, why not? Some of my students went on to teaching and selling. It's part of the process. They don't paint like me. They, they develop their own style. And that's what I offer. It's like I meet you where you're at. Like if you have a certain way of working and you're at a certain level, I look at what you've got going on and say, okay, let's, let's go in this direction. Why? Because eh, there's this, this, this happening. Let's go in this direction. And we open that door. And that's what we do. You know? so. You mean that's it? I don't have to say anything else? <laughs> Yay! So, 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 what about the? You, so you were talking about how many layers you put on it. Do you ever get? Does it ever get gummy or not? But no, I don't it, work with the gummy. So I'm it's it's gummy right now. That's why I stop. It's gummy. Okay. Yeah. This is where I don't touch it. It's gummy. And so you have to you have to respect that. And then if I, if I have enough like time or I start another painting, and I least I put down that vase, and then this this needs to dry overnight. You know, it's, it's going because it's not just the surface, as you know, the surface might feel dry, but underneath there's still something happening. And then the acrylic really has to penetrate the canvas. And then, like I said, the next day, tomorrow, if we can get a varnish from Home Depot or some hardware store, I will put the varnish on top of this. I have some. Okay, you have some in wax? Yeah. Oh, great. Fantastic. Yeah, so tomorrow morning, first thing, put the varnish on it. And then I'll work with that. And then, I start mixing my paints with varnish, you'll see the result. Mm -hmm. Because when, when you mix it with just with water, this is what happens. So you get this sort of like coagulation that starts to happen. The paint breaks open this. The varnish just has a plastic polymer in it. It won't let the paint spread out this way. It's gonna keep the paint tight and you'll still be able to see it transparent. Like who said, water, like watercolors. Mm -hmm. So the gum arabic in the watercolor doesn't let the paint spread out like, to the point where it gets Globby. <coughs> the varnish does the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's all like years and years of experimentation, honestly. And one, the other reason, the other thing I used to do also is uh, I do less of that now, but I used to take my canvases like this, and then I used to uh, buy a speckle for the wall, and, and then I used to put varnish in it, and so I used to elasticize it so it wouldn't be so dry. 
and I would put that onto my canvas, and with the trowel, a trowel I would just basically spread it this way, and, uh, and it would be super smooth with it, it would be very rough. I wanted it to be, I could just pop, you know? And it would build these textures, that would be like textures and down, almost like sculpting. And I would let that dry, and then I would paint on top of that with heavy, heavier paints. So my baseline of what's already thick has already been established, and then I'm just putting more on that. So what happened with that, the reason I used to put the varnish is because some of my large canvases, I have to ship them overseas. So you take them off, the support, you roll them, and then once it gets overseas, they roll them back again onto the stretchers. Not a single crack with the, with the plastic. That's amazing. Not a single crack. Yeah, and they were rolled tight, they were like this. So you have, I have to think about all of that. And about just, how thick was your, oh, that thick and it's still in crack. Yeah, so, you know, you think about everything. That's why my pants still haven't cracked after I wash them. <laughs> I, I really like this scratch that you went through there with that, because it's geometric and it really contrasts the organic shapes. It's just like a party here. Right. It's, like, so it's like a party. It's, it's a party. fun. It's like right. It's fun. It's yeah. this movement. It's like yeah. Just, the movement is definitely. It's just, right. It's not static. It's not static. Do you so, ever use a roller? A brayer? A for what? What would you use? I use it to maybe put put a base coat on my painting. Yeah. Sometimes I use a roller for the varnish. You know, if it's a flat. Not wood paint. No, I mean I do use house paints a lot. I'll use a lot of house paints. I mean, they're great. You go to the hardware store, you pick yourself up those small cans. Yeah. Matches. Yeah. So how does that stuff look like the acrylic 65, the house paint? So, yeah. It doesn't have, there's a binder in there that doesn't really respond. It's chemicals, right? So yeah. you can try it though. I've tried it a few times, but what I like about house paint is that it comes down flat. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you want a really flat background. But the, um, the technology behind house paint is not what it was even like 15 years ago, 10 years ago. The durability and the amount of pigment that they put now, it's like far surpasses anything I've ever tried. And I used to paint with them in the beginning and I'm like, man, the pigment, you know, but now I'm like, poof. When we do murals uh, with, with outdoors, we're using house paint, but like exterior house paint. It's UV really protected. I mean, if, and if you paint with that on the indoors and you're painting, it's not going anywhere. It's like, so it's, it's a lot of viruses are starting to use that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. yeah. And so spray paint, we can come in with spray paint. Yeah, so house paint has good longevity. Yeah, well, if it stays outside for 15 years, yeah. like rain and snow and thunder, and yeah, imagine inside. Yeah, it has good longevity. I mean, it was, it was controversial when Paul was using it because it was brand new mm -hmm. and he hadn't figured out the acrylic binder yet, but that molecule today is like, it's solid. And you, you get all kinds of, and you have a lot of golden paints, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of times I look at the, look at the they, they basically rebranded that as the highest material and sell it for four times the price. Right. House paint. House paint. Yeah. So, I mean, it's good paint that has a lot of pigment, it doesn't get me wrong. But if ever you want a cheap alternative and you're looking for a specific color, you've got the entire color palette in front of you there. And I just choose, boom, 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 you see it. You have more variation than you do with these guys. Well, I'm thinking too, just a cheap, a less expensive way yep. to just practice. Absolutely, and always, just, mm. always. It's what led me down that, that road because yeah. I'm like, um, you know, I'm also like, I'm not naive in the way that uh, companies uh, sell their products, and I'm looking at that, and I'm like, some of the tubes I would buy would have less pigment, and it was really expensive, and you can tell, I'm like, there's got to be an alternative to this. Mm -hmm. So let me try house paint. And I've done so many paintings with that, even if it's a background and then I finish with the acrylic, it works. Yeah. Or if, and we did just did a big, big project in Montreal and we bought like a thousand dollars worth of house paint. And man, the entire thing was done like that. And it's not going anywhere. Yeah. So try that. And then put the varnish on top. You can mix it with the acrylic 65. You can try that also. You know, it already has its own binder. Uh, and the other thing also, you know, get yourself some styrofoam plates to see how I'm working with that. Don't be afraid to use the paint, like mix a lot of paint. It's not like oils, where oil is a small drop, goes a long way. You need a lot of paint, and that's why I say again, house paint is good for that. Do you ever have any problems with adhesion when you're combining all these things, house paint, acrylic, varnish, and so on? So far, no, no, but 
I'm still young, we'll see what happens in 20 years from now. <laughs> 30 years. Um, more water, water, water. You should have a problem. You put oil in there, you're gonna have a problem. Okay, because uh, you start with a crook and then you put the oil on top, as you know, you're good. You start with oil, you put a crook, it's never gonna work. And that includes the varnishes also. So just stick, stick to that, not a problem.